The No Man's Sky Living Ship update has been out now for a few days, and in this time I've collected everything you need to know about living ships, from how to obtain them all the way to how to gear them up with what technology. Living ships, as of this guide being made, cannot be obtained by the standard means. These being purchasing from a space station or trading post or finding them crashed on planet surfaces in the usual way. First you must complete the origin quest line, Starbirth. This is a long and fun storyline that I explain in the next section in a very general and non-spoilery way. Once completed you may obtain further living ships via a void egg and 10,000 nanites. By buying the void egg and then pulsing about until you are hailed and given the location of a ship for 10,000 nanites. This location will only reward a living ship to you, making it pointless to mark for others to gain for any other reason than marking a random crash ship site, as those sites will be existing crash ship sites. It's worth noting that even if someone is in your game as you get the ship, they will see what is usually at the crash site, and not the living ship you are seeing. The origin questline is what unlocks living ships. It takes approximately 5 days to complete due to time locks at points throughout, but is a really great questline and brings a large feeling of achievement as well as an earned entitlement to your new spacefaring friend. Throughout this section to both keep things concise and prevent spoilers wherever possible, I'll simply explain the mechanics of this questline and generally how it works, but will avoid lore and as many details as possible. If you want to see a full walkthrough, then check out my Starbirth Let's Play series, where I've documented the full questline in both video and roleplay journal mission logs on zanesworld.com. The Voider can be purchased from the Quicksilver Synthesis bot on the Anomaly for 3200 Quicksilver. This is the only current legit method of obtaining it. Quicksilver can be gained via daily Quicksilver missions found at the mission console of the Nexus. These reward 250 Quicksilver each and, as Daily suggests, are a one per day affair. Though they do stack up to three, so you can just do three at once every three days. There is also the weekend event. These start at 6pm GMT every Friday and go through till early Monday morning. They require a somewhat similar time investment to the dailies, but focus to a single planet for all players and reward 1200 Quicksilver. Doing one weekend event and 8 dailies will net you 3200 Quicksilver, so you can start your adventure with Voidy the Void Egg, though your in-game Void Egg won't give you helpful tips like this little guy does. Once you have your Void Egg, if you want the true experience then you may wish to warp a great number of times to receive random clues to a portal address and then go to that address in Euclid for a little tidbit of lore, though really the whole thing was just a teaser to the living ship update so I would suggest at most warping till you receive a single clue and then heading through the portal to this address where the mini teaser quest will take over with a riddle type clue. It should be noted that you do not need to do this teaser mission in order to do the origin questline, it is just a bit of extra flavour. To start the origin questline once you have your egg, simply pulse through space for a bit, 30 to 90 seconds, and you'll be hailed. After this event you will be urged to enter the galaxy map and warp to a marked system. This system will either always be a blue star system or just usually, due to the planet required for the next step, so you will need the Indium Hyperdrive module installed on whichever ship you plan to warp with. At this point your Void Egg will also have changed. Your Void Egg will progressively change throughout the questline, this happens after each hailing event. Your Egg will give details to where you need to go. These details are also found in the quest text in your log. Once you arrive at the specified system, head into the atmosphere of the monochromatic planet and you will be given a set of Latin long coordinates. These coordinates will be vague and incomplete and refer to a large area of the planet, large as far as searching for something at least. The idea for this is that you are to travel to those coordinates and search around, you are looking for an ancient plaque. If you get quite close to it, the coordinates on your screen will give you the first decimal. Closer again, almost on top of it at this point, it will give you the rest. A few quick tips when it comes to locating a point of interest via Latin long. Always start with the second coordinate, in this example, 
minus 90 sixths a second. To increase or decrease this, you'll have to travel. What is easy is to perceive as east and west. There are no markers for east and west, which is why we do it first, as when you refine the second coordinate and are in the correct long point, you can line up perfectly with north and south to then decrease or increase the lat coordinate without veering off course. Other useful tips are to do atmosphere jumps, where you pulse into the outer atmosphere and then skim the atmosphere to jump around the planet more quickly. Doing this while keeping your heading true will allow you to make surprisingly accurate movements and get to your destination faster. Lastly, for fine tuning, once you are under 30 from your destination, you can fly just below the atmosphere line. This is where you switch from being within the atmosphere to being in space. You can tell you are within the atmosphere as the lat and long are visible on your dashboard. Just under this line to space there is a sweet spot, where you will be flying incredibly fast, yet able to see your planetary location. Use this to speedily and accurately travel across long distances. A big upside being that once you reach your location you can fly directly down and get a great bird's eye view of the area. Voidy tip, gather a few planetary charts for ancient locations from your local friendly space station cartographer. In exchange for navigation data these could be helpful. If you're having trouble finding the exact spot as it will locate a hopefully nearby monument, it may take a few goes, so get a good few of them. Once you reach the plaque you will be tasked with crafting an item. Sometimes you will be given new technology blueprints to aid in your gathering of materials. Craft this item and hand it in to receive a part. This part will require time to mature. This is where the time lock happens. After which you return to space and pulse until you are hailed. The majority of the quest line is this series of events repeated on different worlds with different items. That and a whole bunch of lore and flavour. For those that wish to see it, I have made a web page with the whole questline mapped out with tips for specific points. I thought the choice to see it or not would be better than going into more detail than some would prefer in this video. For extra tips toward the end of the questline, near the end you will get a series of glyph names. These names are unfamiliar with the community's predefined names for the glyphs. So to help with this I have made a decoder with all of the known new canon names for the glyphs, so you can figure it out easily enough. That is linked in the pinned comment with the rest. Before heading through the portal, you may wish to plant a temporary base computer, claim the location, then build a teleporter and a save point for a beacon. Doing this will allow you to later make a choice as far as a model of your ship, as when you come back through the portal, you should manually save, as getting in the ship is the point of no return. If you don't like the model you get first time, you can reload the manual save and use the teleporter to go to any of your bases or systems in your list, to roll through different variations of the final ship until you find one you like the look of. Next is that any grave will do, you don't need a marked one, so utilise the combos marking locations from other players. This is now the last point you will really have to sort space for the ship, that is before you get in yours coming back through the portal. Due to potential system limitations, the living ship will take one of your six spots. So if you have six ships, it will only let you replace for the current one. I would suggest that you take your time and decide on a ship to scrap, so that you get some nanites, units and augment to your ships instead of just losing it in a trade. Living ships have only one size, though technically they have three, but all three sizes are the same slot in the main and tech. Whether in the future larger ships will be added seems likely, but for the moment all living ships will be spawned with 22 slots in the main inventory and 21 in the tech. There is no range for these ships, like there is for all others, so trying rerolls and more for slots won't get you anywhere. One thing these alien ships do have is a maximum slot for main and tech regarding upgrading. And there are odd numbers compared to standard starships. Before you get too excited, upgrading of living ships is not currently implemented in the game, but these stats kind of prove they will be, and I expect it will be different to standard ships, probably similar to the evolving of technology with nanites and or rare resources to evolve the ship. The main inventory of an alien ship has the capacity to be upgraded to a maximum of 35 slots, with the technology slots being at a maximum of 48. This total slot count is higher than any other starship, and it's weighted heavily to the technology. 
There is currently less technology for alien ships than there are for normal, as yes, they do have completely separate technology. It is all organic, so these maximum upgrade stats seem to imply we will be getting more technology for them as time goes on. Value is less important for these ships as they are not currently available in the wild, so you need a void egg and 10,000 nanites per ship. But they can be traded for a standard ship, and they really aren't worth much at all. The 22 slot alien ship has a base value of just under 3 million units, so its trading price at the standard trading value of 70% is a mere 2,085,000 units. One thing you'll be happy to know is that every alien ship will always be S class, so no worries about doing all that work and getting a C class ship. Now, the basic stats of damage, shields, and hyperdrive. They are very similar stats to exotic ships, with a range of 35 to 50 for the damage, which is the same as exotic, 50 to 65 for the hyperdrive, which is also the same, and yes, sword, very, very nicely done on your max hyperdrive alien from your stream the other day. The shields, however, are very low in comparison. They are 10 to 25, which is a slightly worse overall range than a fighter shield at S class. It does feel like it makes a sort of sense as it is organic and how the shielding works on it with the technology. But I think this was all chosen with balancing in mind, because they don't want to make this all-powerful ship like what happened with exotics, where it was the best of all three in one, with its slot count dragging it down, then adding upgrading made everyone only ever use exotics, so they had to rebalance the stats. It is also likely that due to the very different tech, some of these stats need to be lower. The last stat is a hidden stat for alien ships, and that is just the alien stat. It is always a value of 1. I can only assume that this stat is used to work out whether you are flying an alien ship when the game needs to evaluate what space encounters you will be facing, so you don't run into eggs when in a fighter. Living ships have their own complete set of technology. There are currently six different types and all six primary modules will be installed on your ship from the start and cannot be removed. First is a pulsing heart. This is your pulse drive and acts in the same way as a regular pulse drive, except it takes different fuel. Where a regular pulse drive will take tritium and pyrite to fuel, the pulsing core requires silver or gold. This makes full sense due to the available materials from asteroids. Also with most of these you'll notice callbacks, like the pulsating core item required in the Origin questline needing gold as one of the ingredients. Next is a neural assembly, this is your launch thruster, which requires oxygen or mordite as fuel. Then the singularity cortex, which is where this vessel really shines. The singularity cortex acts like a normal hyperdrive in that it can warp at base 5 times. This is before any upgrade of course. It has a standard base range of 100 light years, which ends up as 101 through conversions. And as stated before, the ship can have a hyperdrive range bonus of up to 65% extra. This is all good, but standard. Where the Singularity Cortex really shines is that not only does it run off chromatic metal, which can be purchased from any space station or made very easily through refining, but it only requires 60 of it to fully charge. Another very cool thing about this hyperdrive is that it has built-in spectral class availability. By this, I mean that it has access to all star colours natively, without the need for extra technology. The only real downside to this is that there are three less modules to impart an adjacency bonus on other hyperdrive upgrades. Next is the Scream Suppressor, which is your shields. Really dark way of doing it too, as it is supposed to be a symbiotic organism that prevents pain from being felt by the ship. But anyway, this requires Pugnum to charge, which isn't too bad as it can be purchased from space stations. The other two are the weapons, Spoon Vent and Grafted Eyes. Spoon Vents are a kind of mishmash between Cyclotron Ballista, Photon Cannon and Infranife Accelerator. They also change what they are based on what inventory the primary module is in. Main will give you large slow projectiles, more akin to the Ballista, whereas putting the module in the tech will cause it to fire smaller, faster projectiles. The smaller, faster projectiles appear to have a higher overall DPS. The grafted eyes are essentially phase beams and do a nice chunk of damage. These do not change on inventory replacement, which may mean the spoon vents changes a bug, 
but even if there is, it's actually a really cool one, so hopefully it stays. Both of these weapons are mid-range, and so the alien class of ship is missing something like the rockets or cyclotron ballista for long-range combat. Though really that isn't a requirement, just a potential spot to fill in the future. They also do not require any fuel to work. They are thermal clip type weapons, and pretty good ones too. You don't feel like they overheat too quickly, even without much upgrading at all. Organic technology for gearing up your flashy new living friend can be gained by pulsing through star systems in your living ship. Every so often you will get encounters, and these encounters, when you are alerted, are either blue standard alerts or red anomalous alerts. In the experimental, there are a lot of fancy new anomalous alerts, but these were just a teaser, and have been largely deactivated in the file, so most of the anomalous alerts you will have in everyday pulsing are for big old space eggs, or from a living ship because you have a void egg on board. These huge space eggs are just big void eggs floating and glowing in space or random and whatnot. If you see one, shoot it until it is destroyed to receive a random living ship technology upgrade. It is thought that the star type and maybe the colonisation status of the system has an effect on the spawning. It is mostly thought that red star systems that are completely uninhabited are best, but really I think nowhere near enough testing has been done to come to a conclusion of any substance, and I really don't know where to look for these numbers in the files. But it's certainly possible. Organic technology upgrades can be sold to standard procedural technology vendors in space stations for nanites. They go for the basic price of usual upgrades. This is very useful though for getting nanites to upgrade your tech while pulsing for S-Class modules. Now you have a bunch of organic upgrade modules, or at least know how to get them, Let's go over their stats and what you should expect from them and shoot for as far as min-maxing goes. The Pulsing Heart has three possible stats, Fuel Efficiency, Boost and Maneuverability. There is a second form of maneuverability in the files, but I believe this is a hidden static stat that is just there as a thing regardless. To keep things concise, I'm not going to read out every range for every stat on every tech type, but I will display them on screen and make the tables available via my website as soon as I'm able. Check the pinned comment at the very least, there will be links to the tables themselves. The S-Class will have a guaranteed 20% lower fuel usage. This actually is set as 80% of the standard usage, which either means that only one module's fuel efficiency is counted or the more likely that they are layered. So 80% of the 100% for the first, then 80% of 80% for the second, and so on. This actually is set as 80% of the standard usage, which either means that only one module's fuel efficiency is counted, or the more likely that they are layered. So 80% of the 100% for the first, then 80% of the 80% for the second, and so on. I haven't been able to get enough to test this yet, but if not, then you could pulse for free indefinitely, which seems overpowered. However, much I would love that. Boost bonus can go as high as 15%, and maneuverability as high as 12%, which when stacking these modules will lead to a very nice agile ship. Neural assembly upgrades at S-Class will reduce your launch cost by a definite 20%, as well as give a point into auto-charging it. The auto recharge function is only available on the S class modules. The hyperdrive is very standard, though with an odd value in the files. The S class, as with normal, will give between 200 and 250 light year range and 100% warp cell efficiency. The weird part is that the A class will only give one stat, one of which is warp cell efficiency. It sounds fairly terrible to get just a warp cell efficiency. I would have thought how it should work is that it will have one or two stats and if only one, then it's definitely in light year range. I expect small errors like this will be fixed quite soon. In the files, shield upgrades are said to give 0.2 at S-Class, though in game they give 30%, so this means that either somewhere along the line it has a modifier of 1.5, or 0.2 is not a percentage and is simply added on to the base shield, which if that was the case would have to be 6.6 .6 recurring, or somewhere close with some rounding. 
The modifier is most likely, but either way I have multiplied the values from the files by 1.5 for the best we have on that at the moment. I'll be testing more when I can to verify this. Both of the weapons are odd ones. Both of their damage is not a percentage value in the files anyway. In-game it is, which means these tables can't really be used currently without lots more data to work out whether your module has the highest damage or not. For example, my S-Class Grafted Eyes module should have between 60 and 70. What it displays as in-game is 27%. Another one displays as 24%. So I'll be gaining more and more data to work out the low and high and try to see how it's doing this. I expect the 60 to 70 is a flat damage that is added per projectile, which for the grafted eyes is two projectiles at a high fire rate. If this is the case, this could become a very very powerful weapon when fully upgraded. Spoon vents have overheat, aka heat dispersion, as well as fire rate. Overheat at S class is a definite 3%, with fire rate being a definite 2.1%. Though that 2.1 will probably show as 3% in game. Grafted eyes only have heat dispersion. This is because, being beams, it already has a speedy fire rate locked in. But the overheat for grafted eyes is very significant, at between 75 and 95% at S class. One exceptionally cool thing that Hello Games have added with these living ships is the ability to evolve your procedural tech upgrades. This makes no upgrade you get useless, as even if you get a C-Class, you can use nanites to upgrade it to an S-Class. A few important notes about this is that when you upgrade or evolve an organic technology module, the stats aren't just upgraded, but re-rolled. On a lot of tech under S-Class, you won't get all of the potential stats that upgrade could have. So if you have a C-Class spewing vent, which will have 1-2 stats out of damage, heat dispersion and fire rate, when you upgrade that to B-Class, it still has a 1-2 to two chance of those three. Those three will have a higher range that they will pick the stat values from, but you could, in the worst case scenario, go from a C-class with 4% damage and 1% heat dispersion to a B-class with 3% damage only. So to avoid this, I would suggest evolving the tech to full in one sweep if this is a possibility. Evolving your tech is a little pricey, but nanites are quite easy to come by these days, so I wouldn't be too concerned. In fact, a guide I have had on my list for over two months to make will be coming soon, where I'll be min-maxing nanite farming to a really extreme degree, to show you the best and most efficient ways to do that. Upgrading from a C class to B will cost 210 nanites, with B to A costing 310, and A to S costing 430. So to take a C class all the way to S will cost you 950 nanites, which is pricey, but really not that bad in the long run especially for a remotely established save. Thank you for watching this, that is everything I have on living ships right now. Expect potential balance changes and value fixes for a few of the stats and maybe at which point I will certainly update the pages displaying this stuff on the website, which you should definitely check out, saintall.com, linked in the pinned comment along with many other things related to this guide. If you aren't already subscribed, consider subscribing and ring the bell to stay in the loop on No Man's Sky news and get notified when I've made some cool new guide or let's play. If you wish to help support the channel, liking and sharing this video is an exceptional help. Or if you wish to go further, Zane's World has a Patreon and merch store linked in the pinned comment also, next to the Discord and other such things. Thanks for watching and have a fantastic day starbursting your new leviathans.